In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. The booze raining down. House Republicans giving President Biden an earful when he brought up the failed bipartisan border bill during his address last night. Joining us now, man who had a front row seat, mm -hmm. House Speaker Mike Johnson. Um, welcome. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you. I'm um, still shaking my head. I'm sorry. It's just, it was, yeah, it, well, you didn't really have a poker face last I'm night. I'm not very good at it. My wife <laughs> warned me about that. It was it was difficult to sit through. It was it was a, a hyper partisan speech that was just full of information that everyone in the room knew that was not true. Well, we knew that he was going to point the finger at you at House Republicans saying, I met you halfway. There was a deal on the table. They're showing Senator James Langford, who people respect and love. And um, he says he fought hard for something that actually brought some compromise. But the president says you guys were the ones who walked away from the table. James had a better poker face than I did. Um, <laughs> look, that bill did not solve the problem, and everybody knows it. Um, we, we passed H.R. 2, our now famous bill, you know, 10 months ago. And it had five separate important provisions, and they all work together. You have to fix the asylum problem, the broken parole system. you got to reinstate remain in Mexico, and you have to end catch and release. That's right. what's putting all these you know, dangerous people out into our communities and then rebuild the wall, continue building the wall. Um, that bill didn't do it and that's why it never passed the Senate. They never actually sent it to the House because they couldn't get it through the Senate either and everybody recognized that. They should have had our House uh, members in the negotiation from the very beginning on that and I, I, I said that. And maybe could have gotten there. We could have gotten there. So let's, let's listen to President Biden. This is him last night on the border bill. But look, if we change the dynamic at the border, People pay people, people pay these smugglers 8,000 bucks to get across the border because they know if they get by, if they get by and let into the country, it's six to eight years before they have a hearing. Folks, I would respectfully say to suggest my, friend, my Republican friends owe it to the American people, get this bill done. We need to act now. Well, I'm assuming that there will be no legislation between now and the election. There was also the other moment where Marjorie Taylor Greene, the Republican from Georgia, she gets into a back and forth with President Biden, and he mentions Lake and Riley's name, though he mispronounces it says Lincoln. But then he says something like, but how many Americans are being killed by illegals? Did you catch that? And what do you think he meant by that? I did. It was one of the times he apparently went off the teleprompter and said the obvious truth. And we're asking the same question. And it is a scourge across the country. This is a humanitarian catastrophe, not just because of the people that are being affected, those who are being trafficked into the country. But now because we have Lake and Riley type events all around the country. We had one in Louisiana just two days, I think it was two days after Lakin's uh, brutal murder. We had a violent rape of a 14-year-old girl in South Louisiana. This is happening in communities all around the By country. By a migrant. By an illegal migrant who's been released into the country. And these are people that they know are criminals. We passed the Lake and Riley Act on the floor just a few hours before the president did the State of the Union. 170 Democrats voted against it. And it simply said that ICE would actually have to detain and put on a path to deportation people who are dangerous. I can't believe they voted against that. Well, and you have had conversations with the president. You've done this publicly, but also privately, really pushed him toward executive action. And now there's this debate about whether he could do something that would make a substantive change at the border. Um, you said some of this is now going to be election year hijinks and that kind of thing, but folks will say you pushed him to do executive orders. Do you now think they will or won't work? He'd better do it. He has the authority. I've read him the provisions of the law that allow him broad authority. I mean, Section 212F of the Immigration and Nationality Act says the president can close the border entirely if he deems it to be in the country's interest. When I told him that the first time, he said, it seems like that's the break the glass option. Well, yes, it is, Mr. President. Is 302,000 people coming across the border in December alone a break the glass moment? I think it is. We had that conversation probably early January. Uh, he won't acknowledge it. First, he said he didn't have the authority. Now he says he's reluctant to use it. If he would just do one executive order, and reinstate Remain in Mexico, the Border Patrol, the people in charge say it would reduce the flow by 70 percent, an estimated 70 percent. I told him that. I said, why won't you do it? He goes, Mexico doesn't want to do that. With respect, Mr. President, we're the United States. They did it before. President Trump did that. Why can't you do it? 
Conditions are different. Let me ask now, you something. That, so you've seen the president behind the scenes. You've had communication with him. You've said you've talked to him. You read him the, that portion of the bill, and then you saw him last night. And Democrats this morning are high fiving each other, saying, "Whew, he's going to make it. He's going to fight. He's going to get us all the way through, and he's going to take on Donald Trump. He's going to take it to him every day." Now, any to me, a State of the Union for a president, they are set up for success. So it was a low bar. He cleared it very well, and now the Democrats are happy today. And the talk about replacing him at the convention will go away. Do you think it lasts? Uh, I don't. I, I think anybody can read a teleprompter, and I'm sure he practiced it 100 times before he went to the floor, and, and he even mumbled through parts of it and skipped parts of it, you know. Uh, I, I think he's a very weak president. I think everybody in America knows it. About 73 percent of the people in the latest poll, Americans think the country's headed in the wrong direction. And the State of the Union is in decline, very sadly. It, it pains us to say so, but decline in the economy and our sovereignty with the open border, the security of our streets and every country, and of course, our statute on the world stage. We cannot have four more years of this. We will lose the republic if what Joe Biden is What did you Biden's think of him starting with Ukraine funding and then eventually getting to Israel and talking about this port that he wants America to build in Gaza? Yeah, I, it was it was such a bad look. I mean, normally a State of the Union at least has some segments that are unified, you know, where everyone can join in and applaud the country, applaud America's greatness. None of that last night. It was it was a hyperpartisan attack speech. It was a campaign speech. It really was, and a, and a, a pretty vitriolic one at that, calling out you know President Trump almost by name. His predecessor, he said what 13 times. Mm -hmm. It was just so over the top and so inappropriate, and that's not what the country needs. Well, he heads out now um, to a number of swing states. He takes this campaign on the road, and they're going to look at they're going to point to the jobs numbers this morning and say, look, this is good. Unemployment is down. GDP is up. Hang with me, and you're going to start to feel it in your own pocketbook. With 17.9 percent inflation and the highest household debt of all time, and $11,400, that's the amount that the average American household is having to spend more just to make basic ends meet. I, it doesn't matter what he says. The facts are stubborn things. All right, Mr. Speaker, Pulse. thanks for being here this morning with us. Thank Good you. See you. We appreciate it. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilmey. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis.